Well, greetings uh, to you on my channel today for this month. Uh, I've got one of the last, I suppose, investigative journalists left to us, um, which is probably, you, probably why you don't see her on Sky or BBC TV. <laughs> uh, there's one thing they don't like, and that's investigative journalism as poor old Julia and Assange is finding out, uh, being ta slowly tortured to death. That's another story which I'll come back to another day. Now, what we're revisiting uh, here is something of a mystery. And the one thing the British like is a whodunit <laughs> or a mystery. I mean, we're still talking about the Marie Celeste. Uh, so this is how far back it goes. And we're talking today about um, the McCann problem, um, Madeleine McCann, uh, which we've never really satisfactorily cleared up. Now, I've asked around before Sonia came on the show uh, because to see if I'm, it's only just me, maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick somewhere along the line. So I did ask around to see how people felt and I suspect you would feel the same way because I haven't found anybody yet I've spoken to about this, not just recently, but over several years, who as soon as you mention the Madeleine McCann, uh, whodunit, if I may suggest it in any other way, it's a whodunit or a mystery, they've all said the same thing. Something ain't right. There's <laughs> something we're not being told, but nobody quite knows what it is. Um, it's one of the weird, weirdest mystery stories uh, since I suspect Rudolf Hell Hess landed in Scotland. Nobody ever really got to the bottom of that even now. So I think personally, there's something nasty in the woodshed. I don't know what that is, nasty in the woodshed. I don't know what it is. But Sonia has made it her business as an investigative journalist to dig down a little bit. And yeah. she certainly knows more than most of us. <laughs> she knows more than me. And she knows more than any other presenter, Patsy presenter, on mainstream TV. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to Sonia to tell us all about it. Uh, and in, in much the same way, perhaps, if I may suggest, if we were reviewing the latest Who Done It uh, by, by Agatha Christie, if she was still alive, where doesn't it link in? What's not quite right? And the other day, just before I introduce Sonia, hand over to Sonia, we... My wife and I watched the French production of uh, uh, a Maigre the other night, um, which uh, which was is interesting because it is in French, which tests us a bit. Um, but uh, obviously Georges Simenon, uh, and we plough through two hours of it, and sometimes we get to the end and we're disappointed because they find the murderer, and there was no motive. There was no conceivable motive, and it's very difficult if you're wandering through a whodunit. You're looking for a motive, an opportunity. That's what makes the fun of a whodunit. And the one we watched the other night simply didn't have a motive. And this is the weirdest thing uh, that we seem to be doing here. So tell us all about it, Sonia. Give us your take on it. Remind us when it happened and what happened. Uh, and the investigation thereof, and so on and so forth with the Portuguese, which is an absolutely fascinating story. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well, pretty much what you said, this thing where you talk to people and they're like, something ain't right, is exactly what drove me to investigate it to the degree that I have. And actually, Godfrey, I had a problem with the story right from the beginning because so we were being told that these adults, nine adults and their very small toddler children were uh, um, British adults had gone to Portugal, Prado de Luf, for the May um, holiday and uh, the May half term holiday. And they're, they're, so there were nine adults, as I say, a, a bunch of small children. And what we were being told is that this young girl who was 12 days away from her fourth birthday had been abducted um, during a period that the adults were leaving the small children alone as they went out in the evening. So first of all, I was like, hold on a second. 
these adults, and as a, as a mother, I was horrified by that. So my initial response was, well, this is already negligence. What is wrong with these people? When I realized that the majority of them were doctors, I was even more alarmed because it's like, if anybody knows the problems of leaving small children alone, surely it's doctors. It's not even, you wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't even necessarily consider that my child would have been abducted. I would worry that she would wake up, be scared that she may choke in my absence, all of these things. So I was immediately alarmed that doctors had been prepared to leave their small children alone while they went out in the evening. Um, in Portugal. So that was the first thing that I had a problem with. And then uh, my the second problem I had was the immediate rush of politicians to get involved. And that included at the time, our Prime Minister, Tony Blair, who was about a month and a half away from handing over to Gordon Brown, who also got involved. So that really intrigued me because one child goes missing every five minutes in the UK. And why we suddenly focused all media attention, all political attention, all celebrity attention on Madeleine Beth McCann intrigued me. And I was right to be intrigued because as sad as the story is, that of a missing child, it is so much bigger than that. This involves all manner of areas that hopefully we will go into. So as I say, there were nine adults. They arrived on April the 28th, 2007. They claimed to have a checking routine in the evening when they went out. They said that they took it in turns to go back to the apartments and check on the children every half hour. Jerry McCann said in one of his interviews that, because obviously there was a lot of criticism about them leaving their children. And he said in one of his interviews, it was no different than us dining out in the garden, you know, of a summer evening. Well, I've been to the McCann house and I can tell you it is very different to them dining out in the garden. It was a significant difference between the tapas bar where they were said to be and the apartments, apartment 5A, where Madeline was reported missing from. And so on, so what happened well, first of all, I thought it's very instructive to go back right to the beginning because that's where you find all the discrepancies. And one of the first discrepancies that many people noted was in the witness statements of Jerry McCann. He gave his first witness statement on May the 4th, the day after Madeline was reported missing. And he then gave a further one on May the 10th. And there were two different versions of how he had entered the apartment that Madeline was in during his check-in routine. So as a journalist, I was immediately like, hold on, are they, are they unable to keep a story straight here? The other thing that I would like to say about this that made me really concerned was that when Madeline was reported missing, all the adults got together and they drew up two timelines of what they were doing around that time. Now, I... I listen to what Judge Judy has to say about these issues. And she says, um, if, if you're not lying, you don't need a good memory. And I did question why they felt the need to, to write out two different timelines, including on the back of a coloring book that belonged to one of the children, which I thought was slightly you know, odd. But let me just take you back to the evening of May the 3rd when Madeline was reported missing. So they went out as normal. Kate and Jerry McCann said in their witness statements that 8.30 at night, they, they sort of had a glass of wine and then they, they'd put the children to bed and then they went over to the tapas bar and then the routines of checking the children began. And um, Jerry McCann claimed to have gone in and checked the children about five past nine. And on his way out, he bumped into a man that he had been playing tennis with, a guy called Jez Wilkins, who was actually a British guy, BBC producer, had a conversation with him. Jez was out walking his small child because the, the child wouldn't sleep. And Jerry had a conversation with Jez. During this period of time, Jane Tanner, who was one of the nine adults who was is part of the McCann party, claimed to have walked past them having a conversation. It was Jane Tanner's sighting that became the big suspect for many, many years. Ironically, the very first thing we saw about the description of this so-called abductor was actually an egg, literally an egg with a few little tufts of hair. And that was put out on TV by Clarence Mitchell, who was who had become their public relations man. Clarence Mitchell um, was formerly the head of the media monitoring unit for parliament for Tony Blair. 
Tony Blair immediately dispatched an assortment of people to Portugal to help the McCanns. Clarence Mitchell was one of them. And Clarence Mitchell became their long-term spokesperson. He actually gave up his job in the media uh, monitoring unit and became their long-term spokesperson. So on the eve, going back to the evening of May the 3rd, so they 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 were doing these check-in routines. And then um, I believe it was Matthew Oldfield who had gone in about nine. 15, 930, 9.30, and he said he did a sort of cursory glance and everything was fine, although with hindsight, he doesn't recall seeing Madeline. It was at 10 p.m. when Kate McCann entered the apartment as part of the checking routine that she raised the alarm. And she, first thing, which alarms a lot of people when they start to delve into this story, was Kate's immediate response. Kate has so we are now told that Kate has just discovered that one of her children is missing. And she let, so there was two, there was twins and Madeline in the apartment. They were very young. The collective age of all three of them was only seven, Godfrey. So we're talking young children. Um, and she ran back to the tapas bar and left the twins behind. Now, I don't know about you, but if you believe your child has just been abducted, are you actually going to leave behind the toddlers that are still there as well? And so that was the first, I think that is the first thing for many people that alarms people was her first reaction. And there are various reports of what she said, including they took her, um, which lent to the suggestion that the McCanns in some way may have known the people involved. And what I should say at this point is that it is a well-known fact amongst police and amongst missing person units that it is a high probability when a child goes missing that the child knows the person who has taken them. They estimate it's eight out of 10 times. On eight out of 10 occasions, it's usually somebody who knows them. And one of the very great alarming things about this is how much control the nine adults have had over this investigation since 2007. So Kate reported Madeline missing. The next thing we know is it's taken 40 minutes for the police to be informed because the official log shows that the police were not called until 10.40. So you already believe that your child has been abducted, but, but the police are not called for 40 minutes. There is also an issue about whether Kate and Jerry McCann actually searched for their child. And in fact, as I say, it's very instructive to go back to the beginning because the early interviews give a great clue. And I urge anybody to go online and look for the interview, which involves Jane Hill. Jane Hill is a BBC um, uh, presenter and journalist. And ordinarily, like you, Godfrey, I'd be highly cynical, but every now and again, they get something right. And on this, Jane Hill did a superlative interview in which she actually got Kate to admit that they hadn't been searching for Madeline. Now, again, I don't know about the listeners or the viewers, but if my child had gone missing, I you would not be able to stop me from searching. I would rip the very sand from the beach to find my child. And they simply didn't. There was a problem. Later, Kate addressed this in her book, which many people consider to be a sort of cleanup job, the book that she put out. And in her book, she actually wrote that they had searched for Madeline, but it was in the early hours of the morning when nobody was around and nobody saw them doing it. So that was, again, very interesting. So there's all these series of events which are slightly untoward. Add to this the sighting of the Smith family on the night of May the 3rd when Madeline was reported missing. Around that time when Madeline was said to have gone missing, the Smith family from Ireland who had an apartment in Portugal were returning to the apartment after an evening out and they claim, and they've said this in a witness statement, to, to have seen a man carrying a small child and they actually stated, I believe it was Mr Smith who stated this, that he, he thought that there was a 60 to 80% chance that that man was Jerry McCann. So these things are all very interesting from a journalistic perspective, because these all add to a picture. Um, and so what we actually saw following the disappearance of Madeline was this immediate media storm. And you had to wonder who did they know? Because I work with parents of missing children. I've talked to um, investigators of missing children, and they say that the response to the McCann case was literally one in a billion. Nothing happens. It was 
some people will describe it in the media as a perfect storm. So what you had were doctors who were decently attractive people. The child was attractive. They were middle class. These weren't working class people who, you know, like a single parent who lived in a tower block who would have been demonized. But the media was largely made up of people who were also were admitting to going on holiday and leaving their children in hotel rooms as well. So there was an awful lot of affinity going on with the McCanns and their friends about leaving their children, but not from me because I was a single parent and I would not have dreamt of leaving my child alone. Um, I, some people even describe me as overbearing, but my daughter has panned out beautifully and uh, never had any uh, doubts about her security and safety. So I think it's better to be overbearing rather than negligent. And I still maintain that those adults were negligent. Many years later, the Portuguese prosecutor said that they didn't actually um, penalize them in any way for their negligence because they thought they were going through enough. That said... Gonzalo Amaral, who many people may know, who was the original police coordinator for Portugal police, he believed that this was a faked abduction. It's in the police files. That if people want to look further into this, I urge them to look at the Portuguese police files, which are available online. And in fact, you could go to mccannpjfiles.co.uk because it's absolutely brilliant. Such a wealth of fantastic information, including all of the witness statements. So Godfrey, put all this information together. And of course, as a journalist, I was completely intrigued because nothing followed the course of a missing child as it ordinarily would. And then of course, what we saw was an, a, a media storm. Do you know by the following morning, well, first of all, I, I, so I've made two documentaries about this. And one of the things that I noted in, in the documentary was the immediate media reaction. And going back to what I said about how many children go missing, that in itself was extraordinary. And in fact, the very first report to surface was something like only an hour and a quarter after Madeline was reported missing. And that was the Daily Telegraph online. And it talked about how a child had gone missing. And I just thought that was extraordinary. And I, so I immediately thought, who do these people know? And then the following morning, another extraordinary thing happened. And that was on, um, what was it called? It wasn't Good Morning Britain, but it was the, it was the program that was, that, that was a Good Morning Britain before it was Good Morning Britain. But it was, the editor was the same editor, Martin Frizzell, who is now the editor of This Morning. And I've worked with him for many years on This Morning. We ended up clashing very badly and certainly about this story because Martin Frizzell was very much in the abduction camp and wouldn't tolerate any form of dissent. And Martin Frizzell was instrumental in um, solidifying this as an abduction story right from the beginning. So literally on the morning of May the 4th, 2007, a matter of hours after Madeline has been reported missing. And please know, I always say, after she's been reported missing because there is no evidence that Madeline McCann was abducted. So I always say after, that she was reported missing because that at least we know is accurate because there is police records to verify that. So Martin Frizzell allowed this woman who was actually a friend of Kate McCann's who turned out to be somebody who lived in the same street as Gordon Brown's brother and allowed her to go live to air to the um, breakfast TV viewers and talk about the abduction of this small British child. And that, as I say, completely solidified in the, na the minds of the nation that a child had been abducted in Portugal. Well, many years later, when I was making my documentaries, I actually went into the PJ, which is the Portuguese police. And it's actually at the end of one of my documentaries. And I say to, I say to them, I ask them about Madeleine McCann and, and, and I say, how many, um, children have gone missing and they say none except this one and that I think was interesting as well literally no foreign national children have been reported missing ever in Prada Luth other than Madeline McCann so again that's very interesting um, and uh, so uh, let don't let me I lose my point here because my mind is just full of so much information on this um, and I do find it an absolutely fascinating story oh yes so the media attention so shortly after the breakfast tv on ITV Sky News followed and said missing child in Portugal well that was it British media decamped out to Portugal 
And suddenly, out of nowhere, literally just days later, a fighting fund was launched. And um, Kate McCann's uncle was interviewed on TV news. And I don't think that clip is available online anymore, but I kept it because I, well, I'm an investigative journalist. And I, and I, when you see things online, copy them as quickly as you can, because there's usually going to be somebody who's going to make sure at some stage they're going to be taken off. And what Kate McCann's uncle admitted in those very early days was that the fighting fund would probably be needed for legal fees. Well, you've got a missing child. Why are you going to, why are you preparing a fighting fund for legal fees? And at one stage, we are talking millions of pounds was put into that fighting fund of which Kate and Jerry McCann had ultimate control. And they used some of that fighting fund to pay some of their mortgage payments. Um, and a very small percentage of that fighting fund has been used to actually look for Madeline. It has been used to hire dodgy detectives who were later found out to be dodgy. Um, and it has, as I say, been used for Kate and Jerry McCann's expenses. Um, but very little of it was actually used to search for Madeline. And we are, as I say, we're talking millions of pounds. And we saw it. We saw pensioners giving part of their pensions for this, children emptying their piggy banks for this fighting fund. People like Richard Branson, J.K. Rowling, um, David Beckham, all getting involved, saying, bring back Madeline, you know, and, and rallying the cause. The News of the World put up £1.5 million for Madeline to be found. So all of these things, as you can see, completely piqued my interest. And I think together that then became many year investigation yeah so we so we sort of got as we always do and i expect your experience is the same when you watch these things a knee-jerk reaction from the public have been wound up by the tabloid press a captain tom situation we've got here haven't we everybody sends money there's no there's no caveats at all that the money pours into the account and of course everybody puts their hand in the till that's um, exactly it all driven by emotion yes and there's too much of it. Yes. I mean, the same with Captain Tom, I'll go off on a tangent, sending money to the National Health Service, which gets 128, uh, 138 billion pounds a year from the government, money they don't need. A kick up the arse they need, uh, but they don't need money. So yeah. that's interesting. Now, I, this is all fascinating. This is all what I how I saw it at the time, without your expertise and without yes. digging down, with other fish to fry, as it were. Well, that's this how is common how... sense works. You're, you're, you yes. instinctively know that something was wrong and you hear these things coming out one by one. But as soon as, so, so my thing was always to pull it all together. Because once you pull it all together and you see one thing after another and it's like, okay, this is overwhelming. So I beg your pardon. Well, I, the number of people I've spoken to, and, and more recently, because I wanted to get a, drill down a bit more on reaction, because this is a reactionary kind of thing, uh, that brings out your expertise. Um, and one of the things I spoke to were mums uh, with children, or some, some more grown up than others, most now sort of semi grown up, but that's not the point, that isn't the point, mums. And dads, uh, are sometimes less uh, demonstrative, but mums, uh, a lot of them said to me, if that was my child, um, I wouldn't have stared vacantly into a camera. I would have been in pieces. I would have been in bits. And the point you make, I would never have left that Portuguese town until I had pulled every house down and looked under every bed and every cellar. That's the natural reaction from a mum, not to look sort of vacantly and then uh, and then and, and to run a fund, of course, for uh, for legal fees, which is the first act of a bloody scoundrel, isn't it? I would argue, I would argue. Very now, looking at, the, looking at the situation with the genre of, of people who ran to the colours, as it were, uh, you know, your middle-class BBC presenter, your people living in the same street, this is screaming to me, <laughs> get me into trouble probably, this is screaming to me, public sector, middle class, index linked to the gunnels, getting together because it's one of their own. Uh, and had it been a gypsy, everybody would have said, oh, it's a gypsy fraternity sticking together. But this is screaming, uh, this is screaming Waitrose and Harrods getting together for me. Um, and obviously you've got, um, 
you've got your J.K. Rowling, you've got your Branson, who are self-publicists right. uh, to an extent. Uh, and so uh, Branson, of course, can go, oh, look, this is a good opportunity for me to look good, look cool, look, uh, you know, philanthropic. Uh, it's a little baby gone. It's very emotive. Uh, I'm a rich man. Here's a check. You know, here's a many. And of course, the newspapers, the tabloid newspapers, well, they're going to they're, they're going to come in because that's what they do. No criticism, really, because yeah. that's what they do. Yeah. Uh, although it would have been nice to see um, uh, somebody like The Sun or The Daily Mail say, actually, what happened? We're not being told the truth. Well, they did. And they got tamed. That's I was just getting my next question. I can't remember who it was, but one newspaper said, just a minute, what's going on? Yes. And they were virtually closed down with that avenue of Daily inquiry. Daily Express. Yeah. Tell us about that. Daily Express. And I, I worked extensively for the Daily Express and Sunday Express. I, I used to write columns for them. And uh, so they went all in and they were really prepared to investigate it. But it was a summer of madness. And so what was ending up happening was some of the papers were running in with stories that they picked up from like Portuguese tabloids that weren't necessarily verified. And it was just an absolute scrum. And so initially it was like, okay, so what we had was actually a series of stages. Initially it was that welcoming, middle-class welcoming, <laughs> the way throws fraternity, as you call them. You know, that is originally what happened. And that so that was interesting. Can you still see me? My camera's just clicked off. You, am I still all right here? Yes, I can see it perfectly here, perfectly. Fine, fine, fine. fine. And uh, so, yes, so initially it was that very middle-class fraternity that was supporting them. And then there was a little bit of distance where some of the editors were finally asking questions, finally. And, um, and that was where the problem set in. And actually, what finally silenced them was the McCanns, um, with backing of their libel lawyer at Carter Ruck, um, sued the Express and uh, won uh, extensive damages. But not only that, an unprecedented front page apology. Now, I don't need to tell you how the media works. If, oftentimes, when people are very badly treated by the media, they'll get an apology on, like, page 48 or something. I in have been that man. I thought you would be. And the thing is, with this, this was completely unprecedented, a front-page apology, and that sent a warning shot out to media. Behave. And from that point onwards, Godfrey, it has been absolute total compliance with the abduction story. And... So uh, that was infuriating for me. And I talked on all manner of uh, mainstream media about it. And they let me go to a certain point, but not too far. You know how it is. It's very circular in mainstream media. Um, and uh, they give the impression that, that, they, that you know, they've got a sort of outsider voice like me. But the truth is, it's very tokenistic and they only let you say so much. So I ended up having to do a lot of independent work on this to be able to really follow it through as much as I needed to. But yeah, so the media was silenced and have been ever since, ever since summer 2007. But it's very interesting. You made a comment about how you wouldn't have left there. Well, again, to go back to those early interviews they gave, they actually said, we are not leaving here until we find Madeline. And as soon as they were made our Guido, which is official suspect in Portuguese in September 2007, they got on a plane and came back to England immediately. And there are a number of very interesting things that followed there. Gordon Brown, who had by this point now become prime minister and had been in touch with them and they had his full backing. He visited their local police station. I think it was like two days after they returned to Leicester with Jackie Smith, who was Home Secretary at the time. And they said, oh, we're going to talk about a neighbourhood initiative. Yes, because, of course, the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister always go to, um, you know, police stations out there to talk about neighbourhood initiatives. I believe they went there to make it clear to Leicester Police what the position was. And ever since then, it has been an absolute mess. And so what we have seen, so the Portuguese police, they followed through with this idea that, that it had been a fake abduction. They believed that Madeline had died in the apartment. And I also believe that Madeline died in the apartment, sadly. Um, and, uh, and I vote, you know, this is one of those things I don't like 
um, lawsuits at all, but you always have to face them as an investigative journalist. But this is one case I've always said I, I would be happy to be sued about because I would like to be in open court and be in a position where I could finally ask the adults who were there the questions that have been failed to be asked about them. This has cost us a fortune as British taxpayers for a crime that didn't even happen in this country. There have been three police forces around the world that have investigated this case, Portugal, Germany and the UK. The UK um, investigation followed a review of the Portuguese case. Oh, just to say about the Portuguese coordinator, Gonzalo Amaral, who ended up in a series of litigation with the McCanns and eventually won over his book, The Truth of the Lie. Um, he was he was um, let go, sacked, removed from uh, well removed from the case, and it was said that Gordon Brown knew he was going to be removed from the case before he did. So that will tell you something, and I think there is some truth in that. I think that's interesting. There was political pressure because he was pushing very much for the idea of a faked abduction, and that Madeline had died in the apartment. And many people believe what actually happened. Um, was because go back to you, you were talking about a motive at the beginning. And what many people believe is that, and this is hypothetical, none of us ultimately know it's hypothetical, it's just a theory, but it does pan out in many respects. And what many people believe is that these children were being given some sort of sedative, a cowpole or something, when the adults were going out at night. In fact, what was interesting is in the witness statement of Jerry McCann on the morning of May the 3rd, Madeline was said to have asked her parents why they didn't come the night before when the twins were crying. Now, I think that is interesting in itself because that tells me they were they were out probably for more than half an hour at a time. There was also a neighbour above them, Mrs. Fenn, who is now dead, who said that she actually heard Madeline crying for over an hour um, during that week, which again was very interesting. Um, and so again, I think I've lost my thread here. Um, remind me where I was. Um, uh, yeah, just the, the, the circumstances of ch children crying and not coming back, all of which seems to be the possibility. And let me just say this, uh, I've spoken to a number of people about this before I brought you on. So I had a little bit to add to it. Um, apparently, uh, in the 1970s, certainly, and I, and this is only hearsay evidence, as it were, it was certainly not unknown, uh, especially for members of the medical profession. My wife is a medic, um, although not in the 70s, she's much younger than me, but it's not unknown for medics to uh, have a mild sedation for their children if they went in to go out. Now, I'm not sure that happens today, it probably doesn't, but it certainly happened in the 70s. There was no question of that happening in the 70s. They, they did that because the, the, whole, the whole sort of uh, general uh, population thing of how we treated things in the 70s, is it was different. And of course, with, with a doctor, and my goodness me, haven't we learned this one recently? The d doctors aren't, <laughs> they're not Dr. Finlay. You know, they're, they're not what we were brought up to, Emergency Ward 10, Dr. Cameron, and all that sort of stuff. They're just other ordinary people, sadly, in latter years, who've taken the Hippocratic Oath very much less seriously than their forebears. Indeed. They're in the game basically for the money because they get paid quite well. They've got a BMW and all that stuff, which we've covered all sorts of times with the whole COVID scam. So we've covered all that. Your doctor isn't a saint. Your nurse isn't a saint. And if they want to go out drinking in the evening, what better than a mild sedative of the kids so the kids sleep all the way through when you get back? There oh, you, you go. don't need the brains of a bloody archbishop to work this one out, really, well, do you? And you brought me beautifully back to the point that I'd got away from. And that is exactly the theory of many people, is these children were being sedated. And there is some evidence to suggest that Madeline died in the apartment. And that comes in the form of the cadaver dogs. And the cadaver dogs were taken in, um, uh, I think it was August, so uh, June, July, August, three months after Madeline went missing. And this is what's very interesting, is the cadaver dogs actually detected um, scent of death and there were blood spats behind the sofa. And so the theory is 
Madeline was sedated. And when Jerry McCann came in at nine, um, 9.05 to check her, and then he was having a conversation outside the window with Jez Wilkins, the BBC producer, Madeline woke up in a, in a haze and a daze because she was under the influence of the of the the sedative she climbed up on the sofa which was overlooking the window that was where her father could be seen in the road below and the belief is that she fell down the back of the sofa cracked her head on the concrete stone floors and died behind the sofa that is the theory of many people um including police but that isn't the theory that we've obviously run with as a as a world. We run with this idea that there was an abduction. So the cadaver dogs did detect scent. And what, again, is interesting is the, the cadaver dogs went into uh, apartment 5A, where Madeline was reported missing from, or the apartments of their other friends, their other doctor friends who were with them, and also the further apartment that the McCanns had when apartment 5A was seal sealed off as a crime scene. And the cadaver dogs alerted to, didn't alert to any other apartment other than the apartment that the McCanns were in and where Madeline had been in. So that was interesting. The dogs also alerted to a car that the McCanns had hired, I think it was 28 days after Madeline was reported missing, and a key fob. Um, also to Madeline's cuddly toy cuddle cat, they alerted to. Now, these were not ordinary blood dogs, blood and death dogs. These were top of the range who had been used in a number of high profile cases before. In fact, their handler, Martin Grime, is, was considered so at the top of his league that he, or he was involved in testifying in American courts for bodies that hadn't been found. And people have been found guilty on the basis of his testimony. So this is not just Bert from down the street. This is high level dog detection taking place. And these dogs alerted to something untoward. And the um, uh, allele, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is how you detect the DNA. There was, I think it was 15 out of 19 markers were Madeline's. And what followed was an absolute mess of giant proportions. Uh, samples were sent to the forensic science services. There were samples that were, were lost. There were problems with the samples. Just all the things that I'm sure will make people listening go, OK, was this a cover up from the get go? Because that is what many people believe. So the belief is that it is highly likely that Madeline died in that apartment, very sadly. But as I say, this story is about so much more than a missing child. And so what we've now had, of course, since 2007 is one investigation after another. The most recent is our own Operation Grange, which was started, I think, 2012, 2011, 2012. And that was started as a consequence of David Cameron's relationship with Rebecca Brooks. See how intermixed it all is. Rebecca Brooke had become incredibly friendly with Kate and Jerry McCann and, and Portuguese police had never cleared Kate and Jerry McCann. They archived the report. Um, they archived the investigation, which automatically stopped Kate and Jerry McCann being our Guido. But Kate and Jerry McCann have never been cleared by the Portuguese police and neither have their friends. And they have never once done a, a reconstruction. Um, and as I say, as I said at the start, the way that these nine adults have controlled this has been quite astonishing. So it, it absolutely stinks, Godfrey. It really does. And Operation Grange... I believe is a, an absolute massive cover up. So far, the British taxpayers have spent approximately 14 million pounds for a crime that didn't even happen in this country. And get this, at the announcement of at the launch of Operation Grange, the inspecting officer announced that neither the McCanns or their friends would be investigated were interested parties. How can you start an investigation and rule out all the adults who were there when the child went missing. And that is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a police investigation that started off appallingly. And I'd just like to add this, Colin Sutton, who is a brilliant uh, former detective and who I've interviewed for my documentaries and whom ITV made several um, drama docs about because Colin Sutton was the detective involved in um, 
the Levi Belfield case. It was Colin Sutton who brought Levi Belfield in um, and for Amelie de Lagrange. And then there was um, Surrey Police that he worked with for Millie Dowler. Um, and there was also the Night Stalker who had been going for, I don't know, 17 years in South London, who was murdering pensioners, not murdering, raping pensioners in their bed. And Colin Sutton was the detective who solved that case as well. So this is a very highly respected former detective. And he told me in my documentaries that the, so the News of the World published that it, it looked like he was going to be heading up Operation Grange, the investigation. And he was contacted by a senior cop in the Met saying, don't do it. And Colin said, why? And the, the, the cop said to him, because you won't be able to investigate it how you want. And I asked Colin in the documentary, Colin, what does that mean? And he said, I took it that I wouldn't be able to investigate the parents. This is, you know, quite extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, the the risk of going down a rabbit hole, as yeah, is my word to. from these things. We don't need to with this story. That we're, but we are talking, are we not? Um, it, I was just thinking, it isn't quite as exclusive a story as we might imagine. Uh, so I give you the word Dunblane. We had the same kind of politicians, the same ilk, the okay. same genre, uh, and I did look into that in some depth years ago, but not into anywhere near the depth that you've been into this. But what we do know is that Dunblane was a massive cover up. Huge. Uh, the, the, uh, it was a huge cover up and came from on high. Uh, local police back off. Uh, some of the more senior local police seem to have some involvement uh, there. There was a paedophile situation lurking here, there and everywhere, which nobody ever got to the bottom of. So you had a where you have paedophilia, you have blackmail or the perchance of blackmail right. until the World Economic Forum get through the fact that paedophilia will no longer be uh, a crime, which yeah. is now on the front burner. Uh, and there seems to me, I, just sorry to go off on a tangent here. No, it's all linked. It's all very similar. You're absolutely right. It's a similar playbook. There seems to be... I would suggest probably only sort of one person in in, in 10,000 would be a paedophile. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it seems to me when you're dealing with a political class or perhaps sadly some of the senior police, uh, it sort of comes down to maybe one in a thousand. You know, it seems to spike upwards. These be Is it politics or, or, or some of these bureaucracies or some of these institutions, whatever they may be, seem to attract oddballs? I certainly, I'm an ex-city man. Um, part-time sort of uh, not very not very effective soldier you know I've had quite a, a career um, I haven't met anybody uh, who are as weird as politics 10 years in politics <laughs> and on in the main they're all weirdos uh, you know the number of weirdos you meet are really off the Richter scale whereas we go through a life on a small Yorkshire community uh, there's plenty of nutters in my village they will think I'm a nutter but nobody is really sort of thoroughly unpleasant and nasty and devious and perverted. It seems to be a much higher level. Now, this must have come. This must have come from on high. And we've got to be frank here. There were question marks over Gordon Brown, weren't there? And his activities in this field. 100%. Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, all of the people around them, they immediately... Um, pulled together their high power, their high powered media operators, sent them out to Prada Luz. And I would say that just to refer to that statement that you've just made about a sort of paedophile element, there have been allegations of paedophilia around this case. And in fact, there is uh, another two doctors, the Gaspers, gave a statement, and I've talked to Mrs. Gasper, um, although she was extremely frightened and didn't want to go into detail, but they gave a statement that was extremely alarming. And again, that is available for the public to read. And they talk about how they were previously on holiday with the McCanns and several of their friends. And they described how um, the Mrs. Gasper described being sat in the middle of Jerry McCann and Dr. David Payne. And she said she believed that they were talking about Madeline. And um, the conversation was, she likes this, as um, Dr. David Payne put his finger in and out of his mouth and circled his nipple. Now, that is in a witness statement. I doorstepped Dr. David Payne about this. He was a thoroughly unpleasant man and obviously didn't like being 
doorsteps. And I make no allegations about him because I have no proof about it at all. I'm simply repeating what is already there in the public domain. And so some people do believe that there may be a child abuse element around this. Um, and uh, But, you know, the point being is that very few people believe the abduction story. And I think that's the important thing. And of course, lately, what we've, what we've all the way along the line, we've had one patsy after another that they've tried to blame. And the latest, of course, is Christian B, the German man, and a thoroughly reprehensible man. He's been imprisoned for a number of years. He's been involved in rape. Horrible man. I'm not here to be an apologist for this man. But what I'm absolutely almost 100% certain about is this man did not take Madeleine McCann. And I believe that the German prosecutor leapt on this story in 2020 because Madeleine McCann is the world's most famous missing child and an awful lot of publicity and money comes along, funding comes and follows any investigation to do with her. And I believe that the German police were absolutely determined to patsy out Christian B for this. And in fact, Gonzalo Amaral, the original police coordinator, said they're going to find a German patsy for this. He'd said that previously, which was really interesting. Why? How did he know that? So all of these things together, the picture is absolutely appalling. The political involvement, the celebrity involvement, the fighting fund, the um, the police investigation where the parents and the adults who were there have not been investigated, the fact that they refused to do a reconstruction. The other thing, of course, is that Kate claimed that the abductor had taken Madeline through the window. Well, it turned out that, that the cleaner had cleaned that window, I believe, on the morning of, and the only prints found on the window were those of Kate McCann, right, in the holiday apartment. Now, I've been to the scene of crime twice. I've I've checked out that place thoroughly. I've done the, the walk distance from the tapas bar to where they claim to access the apartment. I've gone, I've gone to the window where the abductor was supposed to have taken her. And that abductor would have to have been really quite small to have got, got through that window with a child without anybody noticing. None of it really adds up. So it is a, a mystery of giant proportions, but I do truly believe there is a cover up involved here. And going back to what you say about the complicity of Blair and Brown, absolutely. And I would further say that we've since had complicity from Theresa May, David Cameron, Boris Johnson, and now Rishi Sunak. In fact, every prime minister and every home secretary since Operation Grange, indeed since the start, have been complicit in the cover-up. And I believe the reason why Operation Grange keeps getting refunded is so they don't have to, because there's got to be accountability at the end of this. And if it just keeps, you know, if it just keeps going on, it's almost this desire just to let it fade from public interest. But this is one story that does not fade from public interest because human beings like things to make sense. And if this doesn't make sense. And I'm sure after our discussion, people, it makes even less sense to some people because the, everything I say is evidence-based. I mean, it's interesting. They've not once uh, threatened to sue me ever. And, uh, and they, have, they have sued other people, but they haven't sued me. And I have publicly said that I would be happy to be sued and stand up in a court of law and say what I know and what I've investigated. So nothing adds that up. And just one more thing that I'd like to add in reference to the comment that you made, and that is the parental response is very interesting. And I interviewed a lady, a forensic examiner, in my documentary, um, Pat, oh gosh, I've forgotten her surname, forgive me, Pat, absolutely brilliant, American lady who has worked um, on many missing people's cases. And what was really alarming to many people was Kate and Jerry McCann had such a quick recovery. Within days, weeks, they were jogging, they were giving, like, they did it like a tour. Godfrey, they were treated like celebrities. They were sort of doing this world tour. They had a meeting with the Pope arranged by Clarence Mitchell, Tony Blair's media monitoring guy. And Kate, by her own admission, was a lapsed Catholic. 
but they were in a Catholic country in Portugal. So they really played up to that. They went to, you know, Fatima and they did all the big religious thing, which, you know, uh, from a sort of media perspective, it was all really sort of holy and had a sheen of holiness around it. And then they obviously went off and they shook hands with the Pope and did all of these things. But the parental response was extremely alarming to Pat because what she said was, when she deals with parents of missing children, they cannot settle back into a normal routine. They cannot go jogging. They cannot be doing police interviews where their makeup is done and they're looking perfectly fine. She, because she said, the one thing that goes through the mind of the parents is what is happening to my child now? Is my child now tied up? Is my child now being raped? Right? If you don't know where your child is, and she said that the only conclusion that she could reach about their response being, because they said within a matter of days, they were back to sleeping normally. They've actually said that on the record. And she said the only thing that could possibly account for their response is that they knew what had happened to Madeline. And so they were at peace with it. Even though they had to come to terms with what had happened, they were at peace that she wasn't out there being harmed. And that was what she concluded. It's it's interesting you say that because that's been exactly the response from all the mothers that I've spoken to about this subject. They've said the same thing, and even a bloke. I mean, you know, I'm a sort of a, a sort of an old geezer, uh, but certainly if I were in that case, you know, I would, I would be sort of really wound up something criminal because I would, I would want to go there. I want to do stuff. I want to hit somebody. I want to shoot somebody. I you know want to rip people's heads off. Uh, until it could be put to bed. It's, uh, none of it's stacked up. Uh, no. the, the, the response that they had, and of course, one wonders how that could have come about, as I say, just like Dunblane, these things. Everybody seems from the top down. I mean, OK, he's a doctor and he's got the prime minister knocking on the door of the Leicester police. Oh, come on, that's bullshit. Right. Everybody knows. Right. Everybody, right. everybody knows. And of course, the trouble is, you make an interesting point. This one hasn't gone away. Very often, these things go away. Jack the Ripper hasn't gone away, right. all right? But right. of course, we live in a very modern media-driven world. And so if it's not covered now, it does go away to an extent, uh, unless it's an historical investigation on Jack the Ripper, and you can always sell TV time because it's all good. Everybody's got a hypothesis. So, so do you think... This is a tough one for you. Oh, dear. Are we ever likely to settle this in a lifetime? Do you think so? I doubt that. And the reason I doubt it is I think there are too many people who are complicit in the lie. And I refer to the case of Jean Benet Ramsey, who was a little six year old girl. Um, and she was a sort of pageant queen in America. And she went missing. And there are lots of. Um, parallels between the disappearance of Madeleine McCann and the disappearance of Jean Benet Ramsey. And Jean Benet Ramsey's parents, wealthy, brilliant with the media. And there's always been a question mark over that, even though various investigations believe that, you know, people close to Jean Benet Ramsey were involved. But I don't, I'm not convinced that we will um, actually have the big reveal in our lifetime because I think too many people would go down as a consequence of it, sadly. So I, my thing always remains the same and that is justice for Madeleine McCann, whatever the truth of the matter. But I believe that the British taxpayers are paying for an investigation that just does not stand up to any decent scrutiny. Where can, uh, where can we find, well, where can we, there'll be loads of people who are watching this because we will have mutual subscribers, obviously. Um, but so where can they get hold of this? Because I'm quite sure a lot of people would really like to drill down further. Thank you. Well, um, both of my documentaries are available on YouTube. The first one was The McCanns and the Police, and it looks into the police investigation regarding uh, Kate and Jerry McCann and the disappearance of Madeline. And the second one is called Public Relations and Saving Reputations, and it actually drills down on the extent that Kate and Jerry McCann went to in order to maintain their public appearances and how much money was spent on image management um, as well as public relations from the Madeleine McCann so-called fighting fund. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, but what I can do is I can send you uh, the links and uh, if you'd like, you can put them in your description entirely up to you, but they're both available online um, on YouTube. So, uh, okay. yeah, there you go.
we'll do that. Uh, and uh, we'll talk again. We'll Thank talk you. again on other matters. Well, I've, I've very much enjoyed this. You know, Godfrey, it's really good to be able to have this conversation. I haven't had this conversation about Madeline uh, as we've just had with anybody for absolutely ages for a number of reasons. So it was really good to be able to remind myself of how insane the story actually is. So thank you very much for inviting me. A great pleasure. Thank you. Uh, as most of you know, my work is very heavily independently research-based. Uh, and I get my information from all over the world. It would help if you press the subscribe button and the little bell next to it, because the more subscribers I have, uh, the more likely it is that international uh, independent research institutes will share their material with me. It's most helpful, and then, of course, I'll automatically share it with you. Uh, so, surprise, won't cost you anything. Uh, thank you very much.